Hello ladies and welcome to Homemakers Radio. I'm hoping to be able to talk long enough for you to get something done. My original intent was to have something to listen to while you cleaned a bedroom. And eventually I figured out that I could also speak long enough that you could get the kitchen clean or you could get something folded or loaded or unloaded. If you have something that you need to do that is repetitive, this may be a little tedious that you've been putting off, this might be a good time to go and do that. But before you go, I have a couple of things I want to show you. First of all, I'm wearing my gloves because it's I'm a little bit, my hands are cold, even though uh, it's not cold outside. So I've been going through my archives and some of my old things and found these from the 1980s. And we used to wear them to the teas that were so popular at the time. And uh, today I'm going to show you a teacup. And it has a beautiful rose on the inside. Isn't that pretty? I have shown this to you before. It's by Royal Stafford. I am not sure what year it was produced, but most of our teacups that are still usable, that are sold in thrift stores, are from the 1960s. Be rare to get something from the 1950s that was actually very durable. So this is, I thought this is so pretty. It's the palest pink. It has gold, a gold rim on it. And I, I do still use this. Uh, there's nothing on the plate here, but I just wanted you to see it. It's darling, isn't it? And so I uh, want, for those of you who are new here, after I show you all the things I'm going to show you, then you can go. And this is pretty much all that I want to show you today. And so I'd like to start out with a quote. By wisdom a house is built, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, verse 34. And so to begin with, I want to start out by saying that I have great news for you today, and that is life is not on hold when you're at home. Life is not canceled. There's so much to be done, and I would like to say uh, you need to get up, therefore, and get dressed and create your appearance like you mean business, like you mean it. Start the day like you mean it. Live like you mean it. And remember that old quote from Auntie Mame, life is a banquet and most people are starving to death. You're not limited if you're home. And for, for we homemakers in any kind of political or um, physical isolation that we have, it's normal for us. We're used to it. We know how to conduct our day. We know what the house is for and the home is for. We know how to go about it. And I'd like to share some of those things with you today. Now, I want to read a poem to you, and first of all, tell you, you know, wear gloves, a hat, and carry a hanky. And that was the solution back in Victorian times, even in good times. And that was, those are just good things to have. So I'd like to read to you a poem today to start out with. We will discuss a little literature, but today I'm going to read a poem. It's it's called Worthwhile. So you can go look it up, print it out, put it in your notebook, make your children memorize it and say it many times. Put it to a tune and sing it. It is easy enough to be pleasant when life flows by like a song. But the one worthwhile is the one who will smile when everything goes dead wrong. For the test of the heart is trouble, and it always comes with the years. And the smile that is worth the praises of earth is the smile that shines through tears. It is easy enough to be prudent when nothing tempts you to stray, when without or within no voice of sin is luring your soul away. But it's only a negative virtue until it is tried by fire, and the life that is worth the honor on earth is the one that resists desire. By the cynic, the sad, the fallen, who had no strength for the strife, the world's highway is cumbered today. They make up the sum of life. But the virtue that conquers passion and the sorrow that hides in a smile it is these that are worth the homage of earth, for we find them but once in a while. That was written in 1906, and you may look that up. Now today, I, I do want to analyze that, and I'll tell you one reason that I think it's, it's good for me to analyze that. If you've got something to do, you may go on because I, there's really nothing here to watch. And uh, kind of makes me nervous thinking everybody's 
just looking at everything, but I try to make a nice background for you, even though the foreground's not so great. And I got dressed up for you today. So the least you can do is get dressed up for your home, for your family, for yourself, and for the Lord. And so, all right. Um, it's, uh, let me see here if I can figure out something here that, um, uh, okay. I, I don't really need to analyze it word by word, but when everything goes dead wrong, it says the, the one who can smile, uh, is the one worthwhile when everything goes dead wrong. I want to discuss that a little bit because of the fact that in any kind of news media that goes on, that gets everyone worried and upset, and by the way, uh, this day that is not canceled and it belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to the news media. You can't let it guide you the way you would a horoscope guide you. We all know better than that, don't we? And yet, how much time do you give to the media and to the noise and to the sounds and to the predictions? And, you know, uh, if you are going to listen to the media, then I would insist that you give God equal time in prayer and in Bible reading. Read the Bible too. You know, you're, you can be indoctrinated two ways. You can be indoctrinated according to the world, which is the media, and they're not always truthful either. <clears throat> and then you can be indoctrinated according to God, and that's your Bible. And I read you a scripture about uh, the home, and of course it has it has uh, figures of speech in it and alludes to something else spiritual, but I thought it was a very nice one for the home. It's my theme for the home. But you can be indoctrinated either one way or the other. And make sure you give God equal time, or I would say more, more time. And so if you're having trouble siphoning yourself off of the media and uh, you're, you're constantly in an, uh, a turmoil over it, then I would say for every minute you give them, you give two minutes to the Lord. And so this day still belongs to God and not to the media. So get up and get dressed and get yourself fixed up as though you are going to be somewhere important. Now, out here where I live, we're still out and about. People are out and about. They're on their bikes. They're riding around. Uh, the stores are open. Post office open. Banks open. Um, the Walmart's still open. Target. I went to Target yesterday. Target. It was open. People all around. And there were people on their motorbikes having a good time and their bicycles having a good time. People in the stores. And... Uh, Families walking around together, enjoying themselves. They didn't look worried. They didn't look upset. Very, very few people um, looking like they were uh, concerned about anything and smiling at each other. And uh, just really nice. And, and we have sunshine, too, so that's nice. And so I want to also talk about, now I've talked about your appearance and how important that is. Because that's going to determine how you manage your day and what your um, what your mentality will be today. What will you write in your diary today? What will you write in your journal? Make this a special time. You can come out of this great, or you can come out of this uh, as as rather at a at a loss. But hopefully, all of you will realize eventually, from what I've been telling you, that they will do this again. The media will do this again and again and again. And when they're finished with us, they will never be finished with us. They want us to be constantly frightened. We're going to be frightened of our own beds. We'll have to all burn our beds after a while because there's probably something in them. And um, we're going to be frightened of our water. And, of course, you know, that's been going on for years. And I read you something from that old 1908 book that people were frightened of the water and frightened of the air. And they will make you frightened of the air and um, frightened of everything. And I wrote a book called Just Breathing the Air way back like 2007 or something like that and it was about um, and I wrote it with my parents and it was about how they built a homestead out of a um, wilderness in Alaska and the air there is sweet and I even our president when he lands on Air uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base for refueling on his way somewhere around the world he always gets out and talks to the people that are standing there and the first thing he says, and you can look this up on YouTube, the first thing he says is, you have the best air here. He breathes the air. He notices it. So the book I wrote was Just Breathing the Air. And my father uh, used to say, you, you children should be happy just breathing the air. You know, if we ever complained about the hardship up there, he'd say, you'd be happy just breathing the air. 
And yes, it, it has the sweetest air. Now I'm down here in Oregon right now, and I've uh, previously we lived in Texas, and I've been all over the world, and um, we used to go places uh, together in church groups, and when my husband was in mich mission work, and now we are located here. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the home. If you're home for the first time, and if you're home for a long for a long time. You're going to find out a couple of things, and you're going to realize a couple of things that many of us who are seasoned have um, come to believe, and that is Saturday is not a day of recreation and rest, <laughs> recreation, and it's not a day off, and Sunday is not exactly a day of rest, especially if you are church-going people. That day is going to be pretty, uh, pretty hectic, especially for the mother. Saturday night, she's going to be busy ironing all the boys' shirts and getting out there, making sure the laundry has uh, is caught up so they can have something fresh to wear. And uh, then the next, you know, preparing the food for the next day. And if you're going to have company, there's just going to be even more work. So Sunday is not exactly a day of what It is a day of worship, but not exactly a day of rest if you are, if you understand that. And also, the rest of the week, though, and there's no such thing as Blue Monday. Monday comes and it's like a relief. It's so different because your Saturdays and Sundays are pretty packed. And uh, it's, you know, everybody's home. And it's, a, it's you know, getting, getting things, going places and getting things done and getting ready. And then Monday is just like a day off. It's just wonderful. Monday is, is beautiful. So there's no such thing as Blue Monday. And the rest of the week is great for recreation, for learning, for creating, and for good health. And one of the beautiful things about staying home is that you get to have the proper amount of sleep. If, of course, you're not, you don't have a baby <laughs> and, and, uh, or a snoring husband or something like that. But you do have the opportunity to rest. And it's reasonable. It's not run by somebody else. It's not run by a corporation. It's not someone always telling you when to get, get up. And, and if you're not going to public school, it's even better because there's nobody telling you what time to get up, what time to take your vacation, uh, how many hours a day you will be gone, how many hours a day you'll be home, what you'll be doing on your weekend, what you'll be eating. Uh, th this is all dictated to you when you're in that system. But when you're home, it's a great deal of freedom. You will have to learn how to manage it, though, or it can slip past you. You can. You don't want to go through life wasting year after year after year. You want to accomplish something. So you do need to make a list of things that you would like to accomplish in your life, in your day, or during that year. You can have several lists. And then you need to break it down into what you can do today. So... Somebody just sent me something very interesting, and I wanted to mention it as an activity, family activity. She said there's a game called Oregon Trail, and I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Now, as I've been writing, whoops, whoops, Miss Lily of the Valley <laughs> has been writing uh, um, Pioneer Ribbons about the Oregon Trail. I, I was very interested in this, uh, and it's a game. You can look it up online, and apparently... Uh, it's a game you can get which will help you spend uh, a day or two on the Oregon or hours on the Oregon Trail and, and it mentions all the activities that you can do and apparently in your own backyard or from your home Oregon Trail so I'd like, like to talk to you about that I have not actually finished reading about it and I did not order it but it's something I'd be you could write it yourself you know uh, so I want to tell you the day is not canceled, so what will you do with it? Now, my father taught us when we were very young this little word called tinstoffel. So it's T-I-N-S-T-F-S-T-A-F-L, um, tinstoffel. It means there is no such thing as free lunch. Now, we had to... We had to live by that. There is no such thing as free lunch. Nobody gets anything free. You work for everything. So you can't laze around all day because unless you're sick. Um, and, of course, when we were sick, it was disappointing. It devastated us if we had to go to bed because, because it was just so devastating. It meant life would stop and you'd have to stop. And uh, it was more interesting to be well and to even, even work was more interesting. So there's no such thing as free lunch and he um, 
he devised a way that we could earn money. Uh, not just, you know, know that, you know, your parents are taking care of you and you have to show gratefulness and you have to work and clean up after yourself because there's no such thing as free lunch, but also gave us a chance to earn money. And he taught us how to grow things. So we would grow potatoes and then we would dig them up when they were ready. And we always had to use our hands because we sold them to the grocer and the shovel would often cut some of them and the grocer wouldn't take them. And so... Uh, we, we had to dig them up with our hands. And uh, so when I sold my potatoes, I went and, and to the same grocer. <laughs> this grocer was very smart. He had a special soap that you could buy and a brush for your for your nails. And that's what I bought <laughs> because I went around with the, with the soil in my hands and nails for so long. But uh, he taught us how to earn money and so we would come home with cash in our pockets I mean all of us had our our pockets stuffed full of cash and we were supposed to be this poor family but we were as they said and uh, who was it said in wives and daughters uh, mr. Preston he said land rich and cash poor last of the old Saxon stock <laughs> and that's how we were land rich and cash poor so when we got some cash just stuffed it in our pocket and of course our father made us buy our lunch and buy, you know, everything that they would have normally provided for us. We had to buy our own socks and shoes and and everything that, that they normally would, would have bought for us. So they were very, very clever. So then we also have, um, I also want to tell you something here that, oh, I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you. I had that written down on my list. This is something interesting from... The uh, original McGuffey's readers. Now, this is not the, I do not believe this is the Christian School edition. Um, the Christian School edition was different, and it was put out like in the 1980s where they extracted the best out of these. And then the uh, Christian Liberty reader was from the McGuffey reader, but they, they even did better and just did the more character-building type of uh, reading here. And it's by William H. McGuffey, a professor, and was written in 1837. But it did have a few good things in it. I, I enjoy having the uh, re reproductions of the originals, but I particularly like the Christian School edition. But I did find a couple of things in here that, uh, that I thought that you would like to hear. So I'm going to read to you today. And this is called... Now, remember, it was written in 1837. Now, uh, contrary to modern's beliefs, people of that era were actually quite well-traveled and well-read and, and knowledgeable in science and art, history, and we don't really think of it that way, but uh, they got around, you know, and they knew a lot about, about other parts of the world and about the country. And so... I've got two things that I'm going to read to you today. And this one is called The Character of the Icelanders. So I don't know if I could find a, uh, any paintings of the 1800s by anyone from Iceland or not. But I just thought Iceland was very fascinating that they would be writing about Iceland, the character of the Icelanders. Now apparently you would have... They didn't have like grades, but they had numbers. This is the third reader, but it doesn't mean third grade. It just meant you would go on to the third reader when you were ready for it. That's the way we are in homeschool. We don't worry about the grades. We just go on. To, if it's if it's college level and they're ready for it, go on to it. But we don't worry about uh, like when my children were seven and eight and nine, they were college level reading already, and uh, at homeschool. And so. There's so many, so much in here that I want to read to you. I wonder where I should start. Okay. Character of the Icelanders. And here's a rule. And I don't know why this rule was written in here. It's called rule. When you are alone, think of your faults. When you are with others, correct them. This rule will apply to reading and to all things that you do. Interesting. The early settlers of Iceland, like those of New England were a race well fitted to leave a high state of moral feeling and intelligence to their descendants. 
Many of them were distinguished men of Norway who preferred exile to oppression at home. I'm going to read what they write at the end of words to look for to learn to spell and define. Descendants, volcanic, diffusion, literature, gothic, emulation, superinduced acquirements. And they had another one here. And here are the questions that are asked so you can look for the answers while I read this. What are some of the prominent traits of the character of the Icelanders? What is said about the general diffusion of knowledge? How many schools are there in Iceland? What is domestic education? That had to be homeschooling, right? Um, but how do they spend their winter evenings? What is an exile? What is a crag? It is said that they are a social people. What is meant by that? Okay. Many of the Icelanders were distinguished men of Norway who preferred exile to oppression at home and who carried to their adopted country the germ of republican institutions and of the knowledge that, it, that can best uphold them. The most prominent traits in the Icelanders are a love of their country, hospitality, intelligence, simplicity, and piety. Though social, they are rather disposed to be serious. It would almost seem that happiness and simplicity of character had deserted the sunny skies and fertile fields of southern Europe to nestle among the icy crags and volcanic ruins of this frozen zone. It is not so much the literary fame of a few select individuals who have enjoyed superior advantages, which strikes our attention, as the universal diffusion of the general principles of knowledge among its inhabitants. Though there is only one school in Iceland, and that solitary school is exclusively designed for the education of such, a, such as are of afterwards to fill offices in church or state, yet it is, it is exceedingly rare to meet with a boy or a girl who has attained the age of nine or ten years and cannot read and write with ease. That was also said about Americans in the late 1800s, that it would have been very rare to meet any American boy or girl that could not read or write fluently. And this was from the dame schools. This meant, you know, people that hired mothers to go and teach uh, classes to youth, and they took turns. And so there was no public school until later on. And it's interesting about public school how people that you know, when they find out that you want to homeschool, will will desert you very quickly because they actually think that um, public school came over with the Mayflower or that it's somewhere in the Old Testament. Domestic education is mostly most rigidly attended to, and it is no uncommon thing to hear youths repeat passages from the Greek and Latin authors who have never been further than a few miles from the place where they were born. <laughs> Not the authors, but the youth. <laughs> On many occasions, indeed, I, you know, I would have really changed the syntax of that. I really, that, that is very misleading. <laughs> On many occasions, indeed, the common Icelanders discover an acquaintance with the history and literature of other nations, which is perfectly astonishing. A winter evening in an Icelandic family presents a scene in the most highest degree interesting and pleasing. Between three and four o'clock, the lamp is hung up in the principal room, which answers the double purpose of bedchamber and sitting room, and all the members of the family take their stations with their work in their hands on their respective beds, all of which face each other. The master and mistress together with the children or other relations occupy the beds at the inner end of the room. The rest are filled by the servants. The work is no sooner begun than one of the family, selected on purpose, advances to a seat near the lamp and commences the evening lecture, which generally consists of such histories as are to be obtained on the island. Being but badly supplied with printed books, the Icelanders are under the necessity of copying such as they can get their loan of, which sufficiently accounts for the fact that most of them write a hand equal in beauty to that of the ablest writing masters in other parts of Europe. Some specimens of their Gothic writing are scarcely inferior to copperplate. Well, you know what copperplate is, don't you? It's, it was the handwriting of the... Uh, 
the old, you know, like the people that wrote um, the Declaration of Independence. The reader is frequently interrupted, either by the head or some of the more intelligent members of the family, who make remarks on various parts of the story and propose questions with a view to exercise the ingenuity of the children and the servants. Interesting, the servants were expected to learn also. At the conclusion of the evening labors, which are frequently continued near midnight, the family join in singing a psalm or two, after which a chapter from some book of devotion is read if the family is not in possession of a Bible. But where this sacred book exists, it is preferred to every other. A prayer is also read by the head of the family, and the exercise concludes with a psalm. Their morning devotions are conducted in a similar manner. When the Icelander awakes, he does not salute any person that may have slept in the room with him, but hastens to the door, and lifting up his eyes toward heaven, adores him who made the heavens and the earth, the author and preserver of his being, and the source of every blessing. He then returns into the house and salutes everyone he meets with, God grant you a good day. There being no parish schools, nor indeed any private establishment for the instruction of youth in Iceland, their mental culture depends entirely up upon the disposition and abilities of the parents. In general, however, neither of these is wanting, for the natives of this island are endowed with an ex excellent natural understanding. Their sense of national honor, founded by their familiar acquaintance with the character and deeds of their forefathers, spurs them to emulation, independent of the still more powerful inducement arising from the necessity and importance of religious knowledge. The children are taught their letters either by the mother or some other female. When they have made some progress in reading, they are taught writing and arithmetic by the father. Every clergyman is bound to visit the different families in his parish twice or thrice a year, on which occasion he teaches both young and old. The exercise is attended to chiefly with a reference to the former in order to ascertain what degree of knowledge they possess of the fundamental principles of Christianity. These are the means of instruction which the great bulk of the Icelandic youth enjoy. Nevertheless, the love of knowledge, superinduced by the domestic habits of those who are their superiors in point of age and mental acquirements, often prompts them to build of their own accord on the foundation that has thus been laid. I have frequently been astonished at the familiarity with which many of these self-taught peasants have discoursed on subjects which in other countries we should expect to hear started by only those who fill the professor's chair or have otherwise devoted their lives to the study of science. That was deep, wasn't it? And I really, really appreciate it. And, and look at something. I'll just read some of the titles of these stories here that you have to read in book three. Book three, and this was a public school. This was a public school book. Oh, goodness. Um, this one's called a uh, Description of Pompeii, Pompeii's Pillar. Many words in this lesson will cause the pupil to use his dictionary. Let no word be passed over which is not understood. The dictionary must be equally used for the pronunciation rather than the meaning. The meaning must be gathered from the connection. You know, when I was really little, I was very ill one time, just deathly ill. And my mother had, uh, she was Canadian. And when they were young, they adored the Anne of Green Gables series. And she had them all. And they were very old, you know, falling apart. But she sat beside my bed and read me Anne of Green Gables. And she would stop and look the words up because it was uh, LM. Lillian Maud Montgomery uh, was quite wordy, and she used big words. We learned all those words. She had to, and my mother had only a, like a fifth or sixth grade education from the prairies in Canada. And when the children had learned to read and write, that was enough in those days, and especially if they were farmers and and they knew all about uh, economics. You know how to create their product and sell it, and and they knew how to get around. And she had the most smooth uh, style of reading that of any I have never known anyone who could read as smoothly and as well as she could. And if she couldn't pronounce something, she'd look it up. She had a dictionary. And she could read with 
ease. And she wrote a lot of her own stories, too. So I want to read uh, to you some other things. And uh, now I want to read to you. This is rather long, so I don't know how much I'll read to you. Um, it says, The Value of Time and Knowledge. Now, I wanted to remind you while I'm talking to you about, I talked to you about attention money last time. I'm going to talk to you about time money. Pretend that your time, I've talked to you about word money before, too. <laughs> and that is, you know, pretend that you only have so many words a day. So you're only going to use them for something important. And that will keep you from talking all the time to people and wasting a lot of time. But use your words sparingly so that you don't use up all your words and that will also give you more time for thinking about what you say and be very careful uh, I've talked about the home here a little bit and uh, how that you can uh, conduct your home so that what happens there is special and important and I hope you'll do something pretty for your home today and I'm, I'm not reading exactly about the home but these things are really important and that is that in the home, there is a tendency, of course, to, to chatter and talk a lot. But if you receive information from someone who's talking a lot, you can make sure that you acknowledge that they spoke. You don't have to know about the subject, and you don't have to walk away without saying anything. You have to say, mm-hmm, or knowledge, uh, acknowledge that you heard them. And uh, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing. Because sometimes we don't know what people are, are talking about, but we want, we want to be friendly. And I think that, uh, especially when your children are home, sometimes they don't realize they have to answer, you know, when spoken to. They don't actually have to know a lot about it, just, just to acknowledge it. So there are, there are a couple of lessons in here that I might like to read to you today, and one of them is called Mountains, Lakes, and Rivers. It's interesting how they, how they write uh, in a way to make you consider consider something that you might not normally be interested in. But this other one called Value of Time and Knowledge talks about how you can, you've got to be careful with it because, and knowledge is, you have to be careful with it because you can use knowledge for vice. You can actually get quite puffed up with it. So I will read a little bit of this to you. Let me call your attention to the importance of improving your time. This will apply to the home. The infinite value of time is not realized realize this is written in 1837. It is the most precious thing in all the world, the only thing of which it is a virtue to be covetous, and yet the only thing of which all men are prodigal. Interesting. In the first place, then, reading is a most interesting and pleasant method of occupying your leisure hours. All young people have, or may have, enough time to read. The difficulty is they are not careful to improve it. Their hours of leisure are either idled away or talked away or spent in some other way equally vain and useless. Then they complain that they have no time for the cultivation of their hearts and minds. Time is so precious that there is never but one moment in the world at a time and that it always takes away before another is given. Oh, that sounds sad. Only take care to gather up the fragments of time, and you will never want leisure for the reading of useful books. Never want means you will never need leisure for the reading of useful books. In what way can you spend your unoccupied hours more pleasantly than in holding converse with the wise and good things through the medium of their writing? To a mind not altogether devoid of curiosity, books form an inexhaustible source of enjoyment. Now, when my children were growing up, I said reading is wonderful, books are, are precious, but you have to be discerning, and you have to ask questions about the books and the author. Is it good? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Does it re reach uh, right conclusions? Is it is it good for your, uh, for your mood? Does it depress you? Does it uh, give you despair? Does it lift you up? Is it valuable to your life? Does it actually improve your manners? Does it actually improve your understanding of other people and your wisdom? So you can't just say, oh, I love to read. I just read everything I can get my hands on. No, you don't want to do that <laughs> because some of it might not be so good. And um, 
I, I, I'm reminded of games that people often recommend me, you know, these boxed games and, and they have the cards and the dice and everything. It's not all of them are good, lovely, pure things that you want your kids to, to uh, dwell their minds on. On the other hand, there are some that are lovely. I understand this game, um, Pride and Prejudice game. There's several Pride and Prejudice games now. There's trivia games and there are games where they have a game board and, and they all... Uh, go to church and get married <laughs> and I think that's a lovely game that's thinking on things that are good and happy but there are other games that are are not so good and um, you know when we're Christians we want to uh, help each other succeed in life and as Americans that's that's part of our national character too is to we want you all to succeed too we want you to be happy too that's why we send you packages and letters and and we like to share and that's why we invite you to our home as we want we're not in competition with you rather we want to expand success to other people because if you help other people be successful in many ways then you're also helping yourself because you're creating a society around you that is supportive of your beliefs so it's hard for you to understand if you're not an American but this is the way we live is that we like to uh, we like to spread uh, success and joy in life and of course we realize everyone is a prospect for our business and for our uh, for our teachings uh, on the Bible and Christ and everyone is a future Christian so that's how we feel about life <clears throat> it is a consideration of no small weight weight that reading furnishes materials for interesting and useful conversation those who are ignorant of books must of course have their thoughts confined to the very narrow limits. What occurs in their immediate neighborhood, the state of the market, the Iowa report, the tale of scandal and the foolish story, does it remind you of Coronation Street? <laughs> um, that's a That was an old soap opera that uh, where depicted people who enriched their lives off of the comings and goings of their neighbors. The state of the market, the idle report, the tale of scandal, the foolish story, these make up the circle of their knowledge and furnish the topics of their conversation. You know, in America, that's the difference between high class and low class. It has nothing to do with money. It's just, you know, what is your conversation about? How do you pronounce your words and how do you uh, lift others up? But um, making up a circle of knowledge and, and of uh, what other people are doing and the scandal, that's what is lowering you. And, uh, and even in success in business, that will lower you. They have, and, and in your family too, they have nothing to say of importance because they know nothing of importance. A taste for useful reading is an effectual preservative from vice, next to the fear, fear of God implanted in the heart. Well, that's true, you know. Wouldn't you rather uh, have a uh, sons and, and a husband around the house that just were absorbed in reading than someone who just wanted to go out and drink all the time or sit by the pool and drink. Wouldn't you rather have someone that was interested and curious about reading? And of course, of course, wise choice in reading, of course, too. Next to the fear of God implanted in the heart, nothing is better safeguard to character than the love of good books. They are the handmaids of virtue and religion. They quicken our sense of duty, unfold our responsibilities, strengthen our principles, confirm our habits, inspire us in the love of what is right and useful, and teach us to look with disgust upon that which is low, groveling, and vicious. The high value of mental cultivation is another weighty motive for giving attention to reading. What is it that mainly distinguishes a man from a brute? Knowledge. What makes the vast difference, uh, d difference there is between savage and civilized nations knowledge what forms the principal difference between men as they appear in the same society knowledge okay I want to stop and discuss that a little bit because of reading and the way it's taught in homeschooling compared to the way that it was taught in public school in the past now I told you before in a previous video that sometimes they would make you glance at a word and memorize it and the Dick Jane readers were were like that too but one thing that happened when, uh, when, when reading strayed away from pronunciation and um, what's it called when you learn by syllables and by sounds? Um, goodness sakes, it's basic. I can't even think of it. But when you learned how to sound a word out, you were literate almost immediately. In fact, my children, 
without even a lesson in reading, figured the puzzle out. There are 26 letters in the alphabet with 44 sounds, and they figured it out. And so they were literate, and they could read the Bible. But when you went to the public school, uh, many of them came out reading illiterate. Well, of course, they couldn't read the Bible then, so they also came out morally illiterate, too. And some people think this was by, de by design. Well, of course, anytime you let uh, unprincipled people get their hands on basic things like reading and writing, they're going to twist it and pervert it and make it so that it doesn't serve. Why do we, uh, why does God want us to read? Because he talked about, uh, he talked about the scriptures and he wrote them. They were written. And why would he do that if he didn't want us to be reading literate? And he wants us to read. He wants us to learn to read in our own language because we will read his word and do his word and send out his word. Okay. Knowledge is power. It is the philosopher's stone, the alchemy that turns everything it touches into gold. It is the scepter that gives us our dominion over nature. The key that unlocks the storehouse of creation and opens to us the treasures of the universe. The circumstances in which you are placed as members of a free and intelligent community demand of you a careful improvement of the means of knowledge you enjoy. Didn't Darcy say something about Elizabeth um, paying attention to knowledge and reading <laughs> as being very attractive to him? Um, you live in a great age of mental excitement. Now, this was written in 1837. You live in a great age of mental excitement. The public mind is awake, and society in general is fast rising on a scale of improvement. So, of course, this was during a great era of invention. At the time, at the same time, the means of knowledge is, is also more abundant. The road to honor, to usefulness, and happiness is open to all and prosperity as well will be for all who may enter upon it with the most almost certain prospect of success in this free community there are no privileged orders every man finds his level everyone has their level <laughs> if he has talent he will be known and estimated and rise in the respect and confidence of society added to this Every man is here a free man. He has a voice in the election of rulers, in making and executing the laws, and may be called to fill important places of honor and trust in the community of which he is a member. What then is the duty of persons in these circumstances? Are they not called to cultivate their minds, to improve their talents, and to acquire the knowledge which is necessary to enable them to act with honor and usefulness, the part assigned them on the stage of life? A diligent use of means of knowledge accords well with your nature as rational and immortal beings. God has given you minds which are capable of indefinite improvement. He has placed you in circumstances peculiarly favorable for making such improvement. Could you say peculiar, peculiarly, could you say that? I have a difficulty with that to inspire you with diligence in mounting up the shining course before you. He points to you the prospect of an endless existence beyond the grave. If you who possess these powers were destined, after spending a few days on earth, to fall into non-existence, if there was nothing in you which death cannot destroy, nor the grave cover, there would indeed be but little inducement to cultivate your minds. For who would take pains to trim a taper which shines but for a moment and can never be lighted again? But if you have minds which are capable of endless progression in knowledge, of endless approximation to the supreme intelligence, if in the midst of unremitting success objects of new interest will be forever opening before you, oh, what prospects are presented to the view of man, what strong inducements to cultivate his heart and his mind, and to enter upon the course of improvement here which is to run on, brightening in glory and bliss, ages without end. Didn't Darcy say um, to cultivate her mind, cultivating her mind? <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Okay, so ladies, 
I have spoken for 44 minutes. I don't know if I will read any more to you, but the purpose, of course, is so that you can get on with your work, and I don't want to interfere with your work. I love to watch videos on uh, on the home, and one of my favorite is called, goodness, I can't, I can't think of it. It was the one I told you about last time. It was a, a video I watched. I believe it's called Princess Home or the Princess Home, and she collects pictures with permission and uh, little slideshows and shows a different one every day of pretty pretty homes and rooms and that's there's no words on it just music and it would very much lessen the stress around you I think it's really important in the home not to let stress enter the home and that's why we can't let foreigners and people we don't know come in uh, through the news media and I ask you this question would you let someone come into your house every day or every 10 minutes and start blabbing off bad news and fear to you well of course you wouldn't especially around your children you, you put your hands around their ears with some of the stuff that they're telling people and uh, you don't want them to think that the world is coming to an end you want them to have a happy carefree childhood free from worry and heavy responsibility so you could write that out for yourself children should be raised in a happy carefree childhood free from worry and heavy responsibility that's your responsibility you don't have there's been a scary part in everybody's life in, that ever existed from the beginning of time if you were to do some history research you could find out that this is true that everyone who has ever lived has lived through something that was scary but I think it's really important that we keep the hype down in the home so one of the things I wanted to tell you I wrote it down is uh, I'm an unbeliever in the uh, news media. I have, I've had it with them, and I have a, a broad experience with the, with the news media. Used it wrongly sometimes, and uh, shame to tell you that I let it dominate my life too too long. And when I got into homeschooling, I realized my children could not, I could not compete with it, and still tr raise my children in the mindset that I wanted them to go, uh, which was more biblical. So I couldn't, I couldn't have that competition. And I don't think you can either. If you're going to focus on the home, you can't have it. And a lot of the stuff that they do is uh, indoctrination and it's made up. And not everyone is an unbeliever as I am. I understand that. But it's interesting uh, that once they find out that I'm not a believer in the news media, and they'll tell me something that's going to happen. Because the news media, of course, they're prophets, you know. <laughs> and So somebody will tell me something that's going to happen, and I'll say, where did you hear that? And they'll say, well, on the news. I said, but do you know somebody? Did someone actually tell you in your ear, someone face to face? Well, no, but I know someone told me that had a brother's friends, uncles, cousins, and, and it goes on and on. And it's never anybody personally you know that said it. It's the news media. Well, the news media don't research. They don't research. They really, they don't investigate. They used to have uh, investigative reporting, but uh, no longer investigating reporting and we knew a reporter we actually knew somebody who was a reporter and he said there is no investigative reporting they take what comes over this wire from these uh, uh, major outlets and they just read it and so there is no investigation but people are beginning to investigate and have found for a long time that uh, that it's not everything it's not your gospel you really shouldn't be listening to it and if you do give twice as much time to the Bible okay now not everyone is an unbeliever as I am uh, but we can still be friends <laughs> they always tell you that you know when they disagree with you and they know that's not possible and see how clever this is see how clever this attitude is that if you don't believe in the news media then you are uh, considered a danger to others because you're not going to be spreading their gospel or their their bad news and so they consider you tainted and you're a danger and they'll treat you like you have leprosy can you imagine a Christian who knows you know they're surrounded by unbelievers not associating uh, with anybody not talking to anyone and totally cutting everybody off because these unbelievers are spreading um, untruths or that you know and maybe these unbelievers are just minding their own business and being quiet at home not spreading anything they just don't believe and uh, can you imagine we wouldn't do that would we because those people are future prospects we hope for them we hope to bring them into our circle of Christianity and but then the other side 
they believe, if you're an unbeliever, and the, and the news media is their great God. It is their great, they are the prophets, you know. They are the, uh, and I, I finally woke up um, after being a teenager and uh, being told, you know, to go home from school and listen to the news and then bring back a report. And uh, I began to get more and more nervous and upset, and it finally dawned on me later on in life that this, this is not a healthy dose of something for you to take. And, um, of course, it's interesting on the news media. The advertisements used to be for, um, for medicine, for things that upset your stomach, for things that gave you a headache, for things. And, of course, the news media gave you all these uh, health problems, and then they uh, sold products to help you, <laughs> to help you uh, alleviate the problems that it, that it caused. So I just thought that was just an interesting comparison that they have is that if you are an unbeliever and you are happy and I read to you about the Icelanders and I read to you about the importance of being happy you know it's it's an obedience to God to be happy and it's a reflection of of your God and God is good always and so I want to talk to you about the uh, I was talking to you about the uh, losing friends last time over news media reports that you don't believe because you're labeled as an unbeliever and and you can lose a lot of friends and relatives too that you you know people you've known all your life because basically in the in the you know hu human behavior is that if life is going well for all of you and there's peace all around you then they think they have you uh, you under control. They have you under control. They have you under their their uh, narrative. And but when you decide you don't believe the public narrative, then they will. Then they quickly leave you because they cannot be around someone who is an unbeliever because that will maybe make them an unbeliever. <laughs> and so it's a strange religion, isn't it? Um, an unbeliever in the news media. You're called an unbeliever. This. I hope it doesn't happen to you, but it has come. It has happened to me. I am, I am unabashedly unbelieving in the news media. Anything that comes from the news media, if you can find me the source, the actual source of the news, the in the first place, and a lot of this uh, current so-called crisis came from. People will ask me, well, who spread this around? Who who did this come from? Well, yeah, you just answered your own question. Who? W H O, and World Health Organization. Uh, has no doctors or nurses on them. They are a um, uh, change agents for, um, you know, changing uh, society. And I'm, I'm forgetting what what the whole thing is called. It had a name, and it was um, it was changing um, changing people's, you know, changing society and ch and changing. Um, it's like social engineering, you know, changing people through social engineering really has nothing to do with health. World Health Organization never talks about clean water, clean skies, clean air, or gardening, or pure food, or, or proper rest, or, um, you know, natural fibers and clothing, or good health. They never talk about things like that. It's all They're always pushing a drug on you, or they're always pushing this social engineering on you. And if you'll go to some of the uh, videos that I recommended, because see, I, I haven't done my research on this. I only know what's kind of on the surface, and I have, but I've watched these people. And one is Amazing Polly, the other one is um, Black Conservative Patriot, and then there's Ron Paul Liberty, and there are a couple of others. And if you'll go and if you are wanting, you know, you, you want to replace your um, news media with some but you still want to have some kind of politics or news or something like that, you go to these places and they'll, they'll, send, they'll show uh, the research they've done, pictures and also videotapes of people saying things in these places, uh, that these globalists that want to control us all. But anyway, I'm an unbeliever in whatever the news media says. I want to know the original source and I want to hear from them. Uh, I want to hear from other people who have experienced something themselves and um, not your mother's aunts, cousins, uncles, father, whatever. And so that is, you will be labeled an unbeliever. 
<laughs> so I think that's very interesting. So ladies, I am going to let you go pretty soon. And I wanted to read you next time some more out of this uh, this re this reader. There's a there was a story in one of these called uh, Hugh Idle and Mr. Toil, and it was to help young young boys learn how to be diligent and how to work and how to make something of themselves. And work was not used as punishment as much as it was used as a, a capital. Like I have capital. And, you know, we, we, we get all this hate hate speech about capitalism. You know, all you Americans are a bunch of capitalists, you know. But my capital is in my hands, and it's in my mind, and it's in my voice. That's my capital. Because you can give me something. You could give me a paper bag. We've got our paper bags back. You give me a paper bag for five cents or for free, and I will cut it up and, to make, and make it into something that is worth, you know, a thousand times more for it. I can take... You, you teach your children, we were taught when we were little, how to take whatever there was around you, pieces of wood, sticks, leaves, anything, what you could make with it, what you could do with it. So today, I'd also like to send you, this is one of my favorite crackers here, and it's called Milton's Crispy Sea Salt Crackers. They're very easy on the teeth. And um, I like to put Laughing Cow Cheese on it or peanut butter. One of my very big guilty... Uh, pleasures and with a hot cup of tea oh it's so good and uh, i'd like you to take your box if you get one of these i got this at walmart not very much and see what all you can do with it what can you do with a box you know why should you throw that away can you figure out what to do with that i can think about 10 things just looking at the shape of it and what can be done with it and uh, so i want to leave you with that be get creative put sunshine in your home uh be cheerful now i got this at Walmart yesterday because we're out we're out and about we're not locked up here uh, I guess we're supposed to be but nobody pays attention to it and I guess it's just too much you know trying to trying to regulate farmers and logging men and people around here it's like trying to herd cats it just would be useless and they all have uh, they all have ammunition or something so anyway uh, we're out and about and I went to Walmart and these have gone up they used to be uh, 97 cents or something like that. It's gone up to a dollar um, 37 or something like that. But they look real, don't they? And so I bought one, and I'll just lay it on a table with a bow around it because it's bright, because it's a bright spot. So do something bright. Do something creative. Put some sunshine in your home. Get dressed up. Look good and read something nice. Read something aloud to your children. Analyze a poem together or make up a poem together. Write a song. Uh, learn to play uh, the fiddle and uh, do whatever you like because home means freedom and there's nobody there that can come in and regulate you. And so you need to take advantage of this freedom and come out at the other hand smarter and stronger and don't go back to school and don't go back to work because you know you can do what you can do at home. So until uh, I see you again, God bless you. I love you and see you next time. Bye.